Welcome to another edition of the It's Cavalier podcast. It's your boy, Mac. Joining me tonight is my friend, Wilco, but you probably know him as Floor and Ceiling, one of the best draft aficionados around. How you doing, my brother? How's it going, my guy? Appreciate you having me on. Looking forward to talking some draft. <laughs> yeah, man, we just got done watching what sir, what amounted to be one of the most lopsided finals games that we have seen in a while, I feel like. And, you know, before I pressed record here, we're just talking about how this, this series, you were kind of hoping that it would be over. I was hoping that the season – the series would continue at least another game because I'm not ready. I'm not ready for the true off season to begin. Like as, as a Cavaliers podcaster, our season ended a while ago, <laughs> but I'm not ready for the official off season to begin. But uh, man, you're, you're, you're all about these draft prospects. I got a load of questions lined up for you and I cannot wait to hear you break down some of these guys um, as a Cavaliers fan. Who, who has watched this team all season long struggle in particular areas, it is undeniable that there are a few different positions of need for this team. The first one for me that comes to mind is a bigger wing, man. Talk to me about some of the wing options that you think might be available come pick 20 if the Cavaliers end up staying put. So I think that the dream scenario for the Cavs would likely be Tristan Da Silva out of Colorado. That would probably be, you know, one of the best scenarios, not just for the Cavs, but here's where the tricky thing comes, right? Like for a lot of the teams picking right before the Cavs, like the Lakers at 17 could definitely use them. Orlando at 18 is a pretty natural kind of landing spot there. So, you know, I'm not sure that the Silva would be on the board for Cleveland, but in terms of, you know, kind of big wings who can plug and play, shoot the three, Compete on defense. You know, he's not an amazing defender, probably in the NBA, but he was pretty decent in college and he's big and stuff and he can move around. So he should probably be fine after like a couple of seasons. I think he would be kind of like plan A for Cleveland, but is he going to be there right now? I would say probably not. <laughs> Don't break our hearts, man. <laughs> So, you know, if we're looking at some other guys who could be interesting options there to, I think the goal kind of has to be, right, like a wing who can fill in minutes at three to start, but hopefully in a couple of seasons be able to play the four a bit as well. Um, I think Johnny Furphy could be interesting for the Cavs. Like, he's not as developed especially physically as the silva like he'll need a lot of time in the in the gym and in the weight room for sure but he's going to be able to shoot the three really well um i think he'll be able to do it you know in versatile ways like coming off screens and stopping up and pulling it up in transition and things like that and then he's a competitive guy right like pretty good athlete i think he's around six eight six nine can rebound the hell out of the ball. He's always going to be there on the glass. And even though on defense, he really needs, you know, just more reads and development and time, he should be able to get there, I think, as a wing defender. What is the swing skill when it comes to first? Because he, he kind of strikes me as a, as a high upside type of guy, still needs a little bit of development. What is the skill that you think that could immediately earn him in? It's, is it the three-point shooting? Yeah, I would say it's the three-point shooting. I think that's what's going to get him on the court, that and his motor as well, because just you know being so engaged and playing hard, I think that you know particularly in a draft class as this one, which is very open, you are looking for those high character guys who are going to go out on the floor and you know that they're going to compete every single night and you don't have any questions about their motor or their activity level. So I think that's sort of where Furphy can come in from day one, shoot the three, play hard. That's a, you know, kind of safe outcome. But in terms of what might keep him off the floor in year one, I think it's just strength. Like, He's going to be playing against grown men in the NBA who are so much further along than him when it comes to physicality and everything related to that. So, yeah, I mean, he's going to need time in the weight room. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that being the case. Now, when I look at this roster and when I look at the guys who could potentially line up at the three, 
the players who are on our roster right now, Max Struess obviously listed as the starter, 6'5", you know, what, what his skill is, shooting the three ball, didn't necessarily have the most efficient season this year in that regard, but he did he did a lot of other things that provide value to the Cavaliers. But still, you have folks such as myself who would like to get bigger at that position, especially considering the smallish backcourt of Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell, which kind of leads me to my next question. If a guy like De Silva is not on the board, if Johnny Furphy is not necessarily in their plans, is there a three or, or a wing out there who who might be on a little bit on the smaller side, but you feel like the Cavaliers should still possibly take a look at? One of the guys that, that had really come to mind for me is a guy like Jalen Tyson, who can create his own shot out there. Is there anybody out there who strikes you that the Cavaliers might be willing to take a shot on, even though they're kind of small? So with Tyson, I I'm pretty high on Tyson. Like, I, I think he's going to go in the first round for sure. My concern with him in Cleveland would just be that I think he's going to have to go through an adjustment that's going to take one or two seasons to kind of go back to playing off the ball more because yeah. at Cal, he was doing everything. Like there were possessions where, you know, they literally like inbounded the ball to him and he would just be getting screen after screen um, and trying to make something happen off of that. Like in the NBA, he's not going to have that much time on the ball, but more so than that, like he's just going to have to be sharing the roster with better players who demand more touches. So it's going to be kind of up to him to figure out how do I bring value off the ball? Like, I think he's going to be able to spot up and catch and shoot at a pretty high level. And from there, he's like smart enough to make decisions or whatnot. But at the same time, like kind of looking at the past two or three drafts, these prospects who come in very on ball heavy and then kind of have to transition off the ball, maybe even someone like Leonard Miller last year, like, you just need that developmental time. So that would be my big concern with Tyson. Um, in terms of like, as you said, kind of smaller wings or guards, maybe who can like play the wing as well, who could interest the Cavs. I think Dylan Jones would be interesting. Um, kind of like, you know, big body Mack truck, kind of guard <laughs> wing, um, can make decisions as well. Similar to Jalen Tyson a little bit in that he played, you know, very heavy on ball in college, but I kind of like, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit more comfortable with his translation off the ball in the NBA. So maybe him or like Justin Edwards out of Kentucky, you know, he had a lot of buzz at the start of the draft cycle, had a pretty, you know, average season, like not awful, but didn't really stand out. He could be another guy who, you know, five-star prospect, kind of top five consensus, falls to the 20s, 30s, could be an option for the Cavs too. Those are some names that I've heard thrown out there, but I've just yeah, I look at this draft because man, you you would know more than I would. I've t I've done my fair amount of evaluation of these guys, but you're constantly breaking them down. So I guess kind of have a general question for you because from what I what I tend to see is that people consider this one of the weaker drafts in recent memory. Um, is there, is there truth to that? Do you believe that there is just a, a, a lack of true star power in this draft class? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a valid concern. Like we don't have to shy away from it. Right. Like mm -hmm. I, I love covering the draft and I love following all the guys, you know, in college, you know, sometimes even like through high school all the way to the NBA, like, it's a lot of fun, but there's nothing wrong with admitting that in this particular year, um, I'm not very confident that there will be, you know, two or three all-stars coming out of this draft. Or I'll rephrase that actually, because <laughs> most, of the, most of the time in the draft, there are two or three all-stars regardless. But in this particular draft, it's just very unclear who those could be. Um, the range for that is wide open. So... The way that I like to look at this draft is that it's not necessarily a bad draft or a poor mm -hmm. draft, but it's not really a star, um, a star player oriented draft. Like even the Hawks with number one pick, they're probably not getting their next franchise player, whoever they go with. But what they are probably getting is somebody who can be a part of their franchise for a long time 
And that's where I think a lot of organizations are eventually going to find value. And and that's kind of the way that I have viewed it. When anybody asked me about this draft class, what I like to say is that it's not starlight necessarily, but I do believe that there are a lot of potential role players and day one contributors, whether wherever they are in the first round. And I guess my concern right now with the state of the Cleveland Cavaliers being I feel like they have they kind of have to get if they d- decide to keep the pick, which it's it's not on the table that uh, it, it's not completely a foregone conclusion that they're going to keep the pick. But if they do end up deciding that, hey, you know what, we're just going to stay put. We're not going to try and trade up. We're not going to move the pick to try and get a more solidified option, veteran presence. Um, if they do decide to stay put at pick 20, do you feel like there are going to be prospects available that can be day one contributors? Because some of the names that we've already discussed, it, it sounds like there may be an adjustment period. It sounds like maybe they might take one to two years to kind of season into the type of role that a playoff caliber team like the Cavaliers would need them to be. Do you think they could actually get a day one contributor at pick 20? In other drafts, like for example, in last year's draft, I would say that it was a little bit more likely just because like the lottery or maybe the top 20 or so was more geared towards like potential maybe. But in this year's draft, I feel like teams higher up are looking for those safe bets just because like everything is kind of open. So for example, like, I don't know, but if the Detroit Pistons, for example, if they were able to draft somebody who could contribute from day one, that would be a dream outcome. Or like the Lakers at 17, you know, last year they went with Jalen Hood Shafino at their draft pick, who was always kind of a a long-term play. But this year, if they can get the Silva at 17 or like Zach Eady at 17, they would probably be pretty happy with it. Even if, you know, that prospect doesn't have as much upside as some other guys. Um, So to answer your question, I feel like it's a little unlikely that the Cavs can get a day one contributor at number 20, but it's also not impossible. Like, I think there will be guys there, Kevin McCuller out of Kansas, for example, he can kind of come in and play a Josh Hart type of role maybe, whether that's what the Cavs need, I don't know, right? Like (laughs) the, the fit probably isn't ideal and his shooting is a question mark. So like, you don't want that with the Cavs, I don't think, but he could contribute in other ways from day one or like a little where, right? Like he's a center that if you just play him in the pick and roll and you just tell him to go out there and catch the ball and dunk or like finish lobs, then he could probably return some day one value. But with Cleveland, you already have Jared Allen and Evan Mobley So, like, you probably wouldn't draft him. Um, So, yeah, I don't know. Just, like, contextually, it's a bit of a tricky spot for the Cavs. Yeah, I mean, the other spot that I guess we can kind of shift gears here, too, because you brought up a couple of uh, names that have really intrigued me. Um, The Cavaliers need a third big, a true reliable third big. Love Tristan Thompson, uh, Cavs legend, even though he uh, got handed that suspension this season. Uh, will forever be grateful for his contributions during the 2016 title run. But uh, we definitely need a third big. And I think that they can accomplish that in this draft. There are two names in particular that really, really I would love for the Cavaliers to add. The first one is Deron Holmes. The second is Tyler Smith. Let's start with Holmes from Dayton. That's, that's where I'm from, my hometown. I have a little bit of a bias <laughs> but what makes, in your opinion, what makes the whole uh, uh, Deron Holmes game so interesting? Hey, let, let me just say the bias here with Deron Holmes is all good because he's a <laughs> baller. He, he's a great player. Like I've been digging into his tape really, you know, the past couple of weeks, like really diving into it. And I've been very impressed. Um, you know, he's kind of been a, a draft Twitter favorite for a while, if you will. But I think the hype on him is pretty real. Um, for the Cavs, you know, I mentioned earlier that Tristan Da Silva at the wing would probably be pretty close to a dream scenario on draft night. And with Holmes, if the Cavs were able to snatch him, that would be, I think, incredible. Um, will it be possible? Again, I'm not sure. Like, 
the buzz right now is that Holmes has some sort of promise in the first round. Yeah. No one knows who it came from. Um, you know, if I had to venture out there, I would say that his range could honestly start at number nine to Memphis, which seems a little bit high, but the fit with Jaron Jackson would make a ton of sense. Um, and the Grizzlies have shown in the past that they're not afraid to kind of, you know, steer away from the consensus in the draft. So, you know, with Holmes, the sell on him, I think, starts at that. He is that type of, you know, forward slash center tweener who can play both the four and the five. But he's kind of skilled enough to fit multiple contexts like he can play next to a non-shooter but he can also play next to a shooter and i think having that kind of optionality in today's nba at that front court position is really key i'm not gonna lie man i i feel like he would be a perfect fit in that front court due to his ability like you said the the, uh, the positional versatility that he offers he can play out of the dunker spot he can space the floor he can run or operate rather uh, the pick and roll. Uh, and I just, there are so many different aspects of his game offensively that entice me. Then you look at the defensive end, his shot, uh, shot blocking prowess, his ability to protect the rim. And there are some semblances of potential switchability, uh, which Cleveland, uh, you know, no strangers to with the likes of Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, both being able to step out onto the perimeter and guard quicker, smaller players. Adding a player who is as multifaceted as Deron Holmes into the front court as your potential third big. I just, I feel like that would be a win-win and that might actually, if they were able to end up getting him, you know, there's, there's rumblings right now, obviously that Jared Allen has been drawing interest for a long time. That might actually expedite the timeline on a potential Jared Allen trade. If you're, if you're the Cleveland Cavaliers and you're potentially wanting to eventually slide Evan Mobley over to the five, you could easily then slot Deron Holmes over into the four. Um, the other name that we, we mentioned here was Tyler Smith, who I do believe would require a little bit more development, which, He's in a, a great place for that this past season with the G League Ignite. But what is it about Tyler Smith's game that intrigues you? I know you've done a little, you, you've done actually a lot of uh, of scouting on him. Yeah, Tyler is interesting. Um, I like Tyler Smith, right? Like, I think I was pretty high on him early on in the cycle. Um, I've liked him ever since he played for Overtime Elite uh, coming out. You know, as a, I think he was a five-star recruit coming out of Dallas when he was in high school. So he's always, you know, had some sort of pedigree to his game. Um, people have been tracking him for a while. NBA teams will be familiar with him, which always helps. And I think that the biggest kind of, you know, pitch that I can give you on Tyler Smith is that he's around 6'10", 6'11", and the potential is there for him to become a really good shooter from deep. Now, with the Cavs, how might that fit? I'm going back to, you know, a few guys that Cleveland has had on their roster recently. And I'm not saying that Tyler Smith plays like them, but I think that the idea in terms of role and potential has to be kind of similar at the end of the day, especially if you're buying into him. So I'm going to bring up Dean Wade as sort of a, you know, maybe lower case outcome. Because I think Tyler can probably, you know, come off the bench in a couple of years or three and like give you some solid rotation minutes at the three or the four or maybe even the five. But if I was to compare him to kind of, you know, a best case scenario, which I'm not saying is particularly likely, but I think that he's reminded him of, uh, he's reminded me of him, I should say, sometimes is Lori Markinen because. Just having that size and that versatility to play across multiple positions. Um, I think we've seen Laurie play the three to the five. And I think Tyler could eventually do that down the line. Now, he needs a ton of development, especially on defense. Like, his reads there are pretty far behind. I'm not going to lie. Like, <laughs> he played at OTE at first, which, like, no one really defends there. Like, 
I appreciate Overtime Elite and like I think that their development has really helped a ton of guys, but defense is not what you're going there for. And then this past year, uh, he was with the G League Ignite, and that was, you know, their, their worst is game atrocious. ever. Like, yes, their defense is atrocious. Yeah, that's an understatement. So, you know, he hasn't been in the best situations to kind of make those progressions um, defensively, but the tools are there, the size is there, the touch is there as a shooter. Um, the concern probably is just that he's not very versatile right now. Like he'll pick and pop or he'll pick and roll and he'll dunk and like he's and maybe once in a while, like a one dribble elbow jumper, but he's not going to do anything besides that. Um, it's a longer term project. So right now I would have him like top 25 to 30. Whereas, you know, maybe three or four months ago, I would have had him top 15 to 20. That's fair. Oh, one of the things that's constantly being posed to me, my friend, is that the Cavaliers could still opt to select a more traditional back to the basket big or just somebody who doesn't necessarily space the floor. And when I when I think about that from this crop of prospects, two of the names that really, really pop up to me is Eve Missy and Zach Eady. Let's start inversely with Zach Eady, who, if I'm not mistaken, was the, uh, the the player of the year this year, right? Why are teams shying away from taking him in top top 10 range? What is it about his game do you feel that limits him? Is it literally just his inability to space the floor? No, I think there's more to it because, you know, like throughout this draft cycle, touching on Eady, but also like really quickly on Donovan Klingon, Mm -hmm. um we've been hearing about like oh you know they can make threes in practice or like in workouts <laughs> um you know if they can do that like that's cool like the that's old great. Ben Simmons yeah <laughs> well like I I don't really care you know like Donovan Klingon was shooting below 60 percent from the free throw line so mm -hmm. like if he makes one three a game that's fine and dandy like he can make three I'm not gonna care um with Edie it's a sort of similar story where like I actually think that his touch is probably better than Klingon's. Mm -hmm. And like, if he's wide open, he'll probably be able to make a three, you know, maybe in a few seasons, whatever. But like his strengths on the floor are always going to come right at the basket or in the paint. And like, I would never want to take him away from that. Because what I love Zach Eady for is how he sets, you know, some of the best screens in world basketball as a whole to create space for himself and his ball handler. And then he has so much gravity as a huge, you know, seven foot four, 300 pound body mm -hmm. rolling to the rim. He's got some mobility, which I think is a little underrated. Like I'm not saying he moves incredible out there, but he can definitely get up and down the floor and on defense, he's going to play in drop every single time, but he can get his angles right. And he has active hands and like, he can backpedal or like open up his hips a little bit, you know, nothing to an extreme extent, but just something that's pretty decent as a whole. Now, would I pick him in the top 10? No, because I think that he just doesn't have enough versatility on either end. Um, you know, on offense, like he's going to screen and roll. And in the NBA, I think that's going to be more or less his skill set. Like, He's not going to get to post nearly as much as at Purdue. Um, I don't think that, like, since he won't be posting up as much, he probably doesn't collapse defenses as much. And he's a, a decent decision maker, but, like, his passes in college most of the time were coming out of the post or with his back to the basket rather than, like, short rolls or on the move or even, like, handoffs and stuff like that. So those are some of my concerns with ED and then just on defense, like, yeah, again, versatility, <laughs> um, he can play and drop and he can do that pretty well, but I think that has its limitations and I'm somebody who really you know, covets being able to do many things on the floor. And I just don't think that ED will be able to do many things, even though he will be pretty good at the ones he does.
Is that the same way you feel about uh, Eve Missy? Uh, similar, yeah. Similar, similar. I would say, like, Eve Missy probably has a little bit more untapped versatility to his game. Like, he can face up a little bit or, like, put the ball on the floor for a couple of dribbles and attack. I don't know how functional he really is doing that at the NBA level, but like at least it's worth figuring out. So that's worth something. Um, Missy, I think, is just like a longer term play than somebody like Edie. Uh, his defensive positioning in particular, like, is far behind, I think. You know, like his engagement and tools and like his bounce is really good, of course. And like he'll get a bunch of kind of spectacular blocks but in terms of like slowing down and seeing the game and kind of like anticipating things and reading the guard and like being able to take away the lob and the shot at the same time he's not there just yet but I like Eve Misi I think he's a first rounder um I've seen some people have him as like high as the lottery mm -hmm. I can't quite get there but I do think he's a pretty interesting prospect. I think he'll lay in somewhere between 15 to 20. I think that's where I'm at with him right now. Um, stepping away from the Cavaliers, who is the favorite who is the favorite prospect that you've broken down? Who who really intrigues you the most from this class? I think uh, I just go back to Isaiah Collier all okay. the time when I get asked this question, because I just I can't understand how he's being mocked consistently outside of the lottery and like I've seen him fall out of the top 20 in some mocks and like the people writing these mocks are reliable reporters. So like, <laughs> I, I trust what they're saying, but I just cannot wrap my head around 20 teams in the NBA, letting Isaiah Collier not be on their team. That being said, we've seen this happen, right? Like Cam Whitmore, for example, last year, Perfect example, yep. I think, um, he was like top five or top seven on my final big board, something like that and he slid all the way down. Then what we saw this season is that he probably shouldn't have slid all the way down. Or like Tyrese Maxey, same thing with him. I think that Isaiah Collier can kind of follow that example. Um, I understand the questions that surround him. He's like a ball-dominant guard who cannot really shoot at a high level, but I will say that like, in my opinion, both of those concerns are a little bit overstated. He's better off the ball than he's given credit for. And he's a more willing shooter than he's given credit for. And also, even if he cannot space the floor, spotting up or catching and shooting, he's such a strong downhill athlete that he can just attack that space and get to the rim and kick it out or draw foul. So Isaiah Collier, somebody who you know people might have outside of their top 20 right now i have him number two on my big board wow i see see that's the thing that's the disparity with this class it's like it, you you can't be wrong for feeling that way either because you just don't know about a number of these prospects really anybody and that kind of leads me to my next question and that is who do you feel is the biggest sleeper from this class uh, you know i mean Based off everything I just said, it might have to be Collier again, but I, <laughs> okay. I, I'm not. I'm not going to give you the same answer. Yeah, don't, I, don't I, give I me the cop out. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I'm not going to cop out. I'm not going to cop out. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at my big board right now, trying to give you a good answer. So let me just, you know, I, I'll throw out a few names out there who I guess I'm higher on than the consensus, and then we can kind of, you know, go back and forth off of that. Um, just real quickly, like. Rob Dillingham right now, I have him number five. Uh, he might, you know, fall a little bit to like number 11 or 12 come mm -hmm. draft night. But I think he has, you know, top five all-star potential. Um, kind of similar to Darius Garland, you know, if I had to compare him uh, to a player. And not just because we're talking about the Cavs. Like, <laughs> in general, I think, you know, Darius Garland is a good comparison for him. Um Ryan Dunn, I, I would feel comfortable picking him right outside of the lottery. I think, you know, he's still a top 20 name in my eyes. So great defender, best defender in the draft, maybe the best defensive prospect I've ever evaluated, to be honest. 
That's um, a name, honestly, that keeps appearing in one of these chats that I'm in. They're in love with Ryan Dunn, and I, I honestly, I get why. The offense is just terrible, is the thing. But I will say this, though. Like, I don't think it's a lost cause. I think that a ton of development and time is going to be needed. But also, Virginia is just a terrible team offensively. <laughs> Nobody there is going to shine in that type of prospect, uh, in that type of situation, I should say, uh, when it comes to putting the ball in the hoop. So I will say that while Ryan Dunn is a very bad offensive prospect, I don't think he's as terrible as, you know, it's being made out to be. I think there's ways to go around it. Then, just to throw out a final name, or two final names, actually, because I, I know that, you know, you and I were talking a little bit about this guy off camera, but before we get to him, uh, Trenton Flowers, he's a kind of wing guard, six foot seven, six foot eight, I think it was, that he measured out as. Played for the Adelaide 36ers in Australia this past year. Kind of had a tumultuous season, to be honest, because they brought him in to be the team's point guard. And that experiment literally lasted like two games in preseason before they moved him off the ball entirely. So I think that kind of ruined his perception early on in the draft cycle. But I thought he recovered nicely afterwards when very few people were watching. Um, can shoot the three well, really bouncy, has that wing size that you might want from a ball handler type, but he's just so raw that he would need a ton of time. Still, though, I've ha I have him um, top 35, top 40 range. He might go undrafted potentially, but I don't think he should. And then the final sleeper... <laughs> Um, who might interest Cavs fans as well for certain reasons and who interests me for reasons who, um, which I don't think are commonly discussed actually <laughs> is Bronny James. And yep. I've been high on him for years now, actually. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm not selling my stock. Is this, you got to elaborate on this for us though. Is it because of the, can, is it LeBron? Is it his actual game? Is there something that you see out of him that you feel like other people aren't? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. Like, the first thing, you know, I'm glad that you brought up LeBron because let's just mention that, right? Like, that's the elephant in the room with Bronny, and it's for a reason. Like, fans who want their team to draft Bronny because they think that could land them LeBron. Mm -hmm. I understand why they feel that way. But I will say that, like, that idea sounds great in theory, but in practice, I'm not expecting things to play out that way. Um, I think that some of the looks that Bronny is getting, particularly, like, the Phoenix Suns rumors, yeah, those are probably linked directly to LeBron. But the way that I feel about him as a prospect – and why I've been liking him for a while now goes way beyond that. It goes way beyond that because something that I've been maintaining for a while now is that even if his last name was not James or, you know, if his full name wasn't LeBron James, I should say, <laughs> he would still be considered an NBA prospect. Is there a particular skill that he has right now Do you that you feel will translate directly to the NBA? I think there are two skills that will translate i don't know how short term this will take because mm -hmm. i i think Bronny is like a, a longer term prospect for sure um like you know i think the idea yeah. of him as a player at the end of the day is not too far away from why we really like devin carter nowadays like devin carter is a guy who is gonna go in the lottery probably who's been getting some top 10 buzz and that's because, you know, he's an athletic, bouncy guard who can kind of play up his position because he's strong and bouncy and he plays with, you know, great intensity and motor. And, like, at the end of the day, I don't think that Bronny is too far away from that as a prospect type. Now, his production on the court obviously lags far behind. Like, he averaged under five points a game three rebounds, two assists at USC. 
he shot 27 percent from three which you know is bad obviously like (laughs) it's objectively bad but now the next thing that i might say could surprise you because like even though he shot 27 percent from three Mm -hmm. i have a lot of trust that in the nba he will eventually develop into a really good shooter do you um, like the from downtown i like the mechanics from downtown and i like the versatility um I, i don't think he got to show that as much at usc uh especially later on in the season he kind of lost confidence in his shot a little bit because like the numbers just were not there at all and obviously like as a freshman you know when you don't see the ball go in the hoop for game after game you become discouraged eventually like i think that's only natural um but having had the chance to evaluate Bronny, oftentimes in person throughout his high school um journey and like having seen him in multiple contexts against some of these guys who we're now looking at at the top of the class, you know, I was always very impressed with his approach to the game, with his use on the court as well. Um, you know, not just being able to spot up and catch and shoot like we saw at USC, but being able to pull up in transition, being able to run out of screens in the half court you know, coming out of double pin downs or like elevator sets. We saw him do that at Sierra Canyon and he was drilling those shots. Um, So I have confidence in both of those things. And then the final thing that I think is crucial with Bronny James that I don't think is being brought up enough is that he has a genuine pattern of improvement over time. And With this, let me say that he came into high school at Sierra Canyon as a ninth grader who, you know, was probably the most hyped ninth grader on the planet. (laughs) And his games, if I'm not mistaken, um, as a high school freshman were already being broadcast nationally by ESPN. So, you know, he grew up around that sort of pressure, but he always, you know, maintained a cool head on the court. He knew how to adapt to different teams and different players, which I think deserves credit because as a freshman, he came in as any high school freshman would in a high school team, Um, you know, being a very complimentary player, having to play around, you know, much bigger stars than him, much more developed players than him. And he could still fit a role, spot up, catch and shoot, defend hard, do that. That's a freshman. Then getting to his sophomore and junior seasons, he's, you know, playing a little bit more on the ball now. His athleticism is really starting to shine because I think that people forget that even though Bronny is a pretty good athlete right now, when he was a, you know, high school freshman and sophomore, like he wasn't really standing out in terms of, you know, athletic potential. Like, of course, he was LeBron's son, but (laughs) it's not like he was jumping out of the gym or anything like that. Like the steals and stuff that he got, it was based on anticipation and reading the game. And then that athleticism came around way later. So by the time that he was a high school senior, people are forgetting that, you know, he was a McDonald's All-American and ESPN last February, they ranked, they ranked him in the top 10. And, you know, you can feel whichever way you want about ESPN's mock drafts or reporting or whatnot. But at the end of the day, ESPN is very well connected and they're putting out information that at least has some sort of validity to it. So the fact that Bronny was a top 10 at some point in their eyes, I think speaks to how the NBA saw him at one point. And this also comes with direct information and direct knowledge that I have being that NBA teams were very familiar with Bronny before he even went to USC. And there were executives and scouts in NBA teams who, you know, monitored Bronny and tracked him and appreciated his game way before he was a freshman at USC. So, like, even though he had a bad year, he was, a, you know, under very difficult circumstances after suffering cardiac arrest in preseason. Yeah. And not to go overly long here, but the, the context at USC, I don't think favored anyone. Like. Isaiah Collier fell way down as well. 
Kobe Johnson should have probably been a first round draft pick headed into the cycle. And he didn't even stay in the draft. He transferred to UCLA. So even though Bronny is for sure a long-term prospect and you need that big picture outlook with him, I think, you know, he's a genuine NBA prospect. And I've been feeling that way about him for years. And I still very much do. I guess my my question is with him, with all the information coming out about him, I, this is probably more so Rich Paul, I suppose, but him not necessarily accepting a two-way contract because that's the way I feel like it's his NBA career should start based upon what we have seen. Do you think that could potentially steer some teams away or do you think the the LeBron of it all as that still lingers around, do you think that will play a part? I think that, well, it, it's hard to know without, you know, inside information, but if I was in their shoes, I would think that teams are more concerned about the LeBron aspect mm -hmm. and the whole, like, you know, following aspect of it all than the two-way contract part of it. And with that, I mean that teams who deal with Clutch should be aware by now um, about Clutch's MO, which I think is commendable. And I think that Clutch can sometimes get flack for just looking out for their client. Like, I think that... We're dealing with that with Darius Garland right now. <laughs> I mean, look, you know, uh, I understand, you know, from a team perspective and from a mm -hmm. fan perspective as well. But, like, I look at Chris Livingston last year, right? Mm -hmm. And all throughout the draft process, there were so many people who kept saying, Chris Livingston's not going to get drafted. He had a terrible freshman season. This guy is not going to get drafted. He's not going to be on an NBA team. I don't know what he's doing. All along, I maintained that if Livingston was staying in the draft, he had some sort of guarantee at some point because he could have easily gone back to college and, you know, kind of rebuilt his stock from there. Come, you know, the last pick of the draft last year, the Milwaukee Bucks select Chris Livingston. They don't give him a two-way contract. They sign him to a guaranteed deal. Why is that? Because Clutch wants to push for that. And I think Clutch should be pushing for that. Because if you're on a two-way deal, you can kind of get cut at any time. True. And a team has no real reason to genuinely invest in your development. Particularly, you know, in Bronny's case, he's being thought of right now as a late second-round pick for the most part. So if you're a late second-round pick, you want the best chance possible at having that kind of, you know, longer term developmental plan. That's why, you know, I wasn't surprised when Rich Paul came out and he said that Bronny wouldn't be taking a two-way contract. And at the same time, I expect that to be the case for every other clutch client as well, both now and going forward. That said, does this mean that, you know, Bronny is going to go to the Lakers. I don't. I don't think so. Like, I don't think it's a as sure file a sure fire of a deal mm -hmm. as people are saying. Um, the likelihood, you know, in all honesty, is that once the draft is over, Bronny James will be a Laker. But I think that there is definitely room out there to some extent for that to not necessarily happen. I think that's fair. Honestly, I have no idea where he is going to end up. I think that he has definitely, he intrigues me from the aspect that he is a viewed heavily as a defensive guard. I love it. His ability on that end of the floor. That is what intrigues me the most about his game. There are definitely other aspects out there as well, but I don't expect the Cavaliers in the position that they're in right now to end up trying to, make him the selection at pick 20 if that's where they end up picking uh, if they do it's got to be almost certainly be tied to lebron <laughs> that's where i'm at with it uh before we head out of here man there's one question in particular that i want to ask you and that is it, when you're looking at a prospect like 
LeBron James Jr. in particular. You look at the stats, the statistical production. How much, when you're breaking these guys down, when you're doing your evals, how much does that actually play into the process versus the actual like potential that you see? Sure. Um, you know, I, I value production, of course, but it's all a little, a little bit contextual. Like, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example, right? Like, for example, my number one guy right now at the top of the draft, and I think that there's a very real chance he goes number one, won't fall out of the top three, I don't think. That's Zachary Rizacher out of France, played for Borg. And, you know, he's an 18-year-old, first-year pro against grown men in the French League. So that's a pretty competitive environment. And also he's having to adjust to, you know, like I just said, competing against grown men for the first time. Um, if he's able to produce at a high level in that setting, then I really value that. But at the same time, like if his points, you know, are not that high or he has, you know, a few weeks where he's struggling or whatever, but I see that his process on the court makes sense or that, you know, for example, he's driving to the rim, but he's not necessarily strong enough yet to like get to his spot, but he has the touch, then I value the process more than the production. Um, I go back to Peyton Watson coming out of UCLA. Like mm -hmm. he had a pretty, you know, underwhelming freshman season. Um, uh, I don't have the numbers right in front of me right now, but like I, I want to say that he averaged between three and five points per game, something really low. And he was barely even getting on the court. But whenever I watched him play, he just looked like an NBA wing based off the way that he moved, based off some of the decisions that he took. Like, even if he turned the ball over, I could understand what he was going for. So I just try to take a holistic approach. Um, I'm focused on, you know, how creative a prospect can be, how many solutions they can come up with on the floor, how many different ways they can be used on both ends. I think, you know, versatility is the name of the game. And then kind of going off of that versatility, quick decision making after that be it scoring, passing, or dribbling, is what I'm looking for. So, yeah, I think all of those things, and then hopefully a prospect is athletic and long and big as well, but that's sort of, you know, overall how I try to approach um, my draft of vowels, particularly in a draft as tough as this one. I appreciate it, man, because when you really look at just some of the different types of evaluations that you see out here from some of these draft experts, everybody tends to value things and view things through a different scope. So I love that answer, man, for sure. Wilco, man, thank you for taking the time to come and chop it up with me here, talk some of these draft prospects that I know Cavaliers fans are very, very interested to see how this whole process plays out because again I, I have to stress this it is by no means a given that the Cavaliers will keep that pick but if they do I do feel confident in some of these names that you mentioned man yeah man I mean, I mean it's gonna be exciting you know the draft is two nights now so it's gonna be two nights where I think everything is kind of wide open um I'm excited to see what the Cavs do because I think they're in a very interesting spot at number 20. A lot is going to depend on what happens before that, obviously, um, as is the case in every draft. But in this one, I think it applies just a little bit more. So we'll see what happens. Um, I think that regardless of who the Cavs take, it's going to be somebody who you'll probably find interesting. So you know, you have that to look forward to for sure as a Cavs fan. <laughs> I just hope people are patient this time around because I know that people are expecting that whoever they pick to be a day one guy, a day one contributor, but that may not necessarily end up being the case. 
We shall see. That said, you can catch Wilco's work on YouTube, Floor and Ceiling. That is the channel. Make sure you guys go out there and subscribe. This man does fantastic, phenomenal breakdowns out there. Familiarize yourself with that name. Familiarize yourself with some of the prospects that he has done his homework on. That said, as I always tell you guys, you know, if you want to reach out to me, you can. It's Cavalier53 at gmail.com. Send a rating, send a review that way, and I'll, in, it, I'll end up sending you a invite to the Discord channel. If you want to support the channel in a small but helpful way, consider becoming a paid member over on Patreon. I create this content all the live long day because I love the Cavaliers, but every little bit helps. Uh, it just make the time spent on it uh, feel that much more worth it. That said, go Cavs. Have a good night.